Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Matt for Remnant TV. We're a little different venue tonight. We're at the Argument of the Month in South St. Paul. Pretty cold night tonight, Chris. How are you doing on the weather there? Forget it, Mike. I'm going back to Virginia. <laughs> it's around zero. I think it was 10 below zero this morning. So Chris came in to, uh, I guess, to take the traditionalist side of a debate that we're having with Mark Shea, apologist Mark Shea, uh, regarding uh, the, 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 divine, the Divine Commission, whether or not the church has reneged on her claim to be the one true church, whether or not conversion is still necessary, what, what the new evangelization means. I guess, Chris, it's going to be, it's, car, it's hard to tell right now where it's going to, where it's going to take us, but he Essentially, that's the, that's the root of the debate of the, of the resolution tonight. Well, we're at the end stage of a 50-year process of a retreat from the claim of the church to be the one true religion, the sole ark of salvation. The Divine Commission is simply go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He who believes not shall be condemned. And that's, that's the commission. Come into the church for your salvation. Well, over the last 50 years, what has happened to evangelization? It has a different meaning. Evangelization now is basically talking to Catholics about um, you know, being a, a better Catholic, spreading the joy, that sort of thing. But the imperative of conversion for the salvation of souls has been completely forgotten. And one of the things we'll be exploring tonight is how John Paul II himself admitted this in a very famous book-length interview with Vito Massori, when he basically said the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, are no longer mentioned in evangelization. No, that's right. If you're not going to mention that. What reason do people have to abandon their way of life, convert, and take on the burdens of the Catholic faith? Salvation is the only reason. And the idea of evangelization as directed to the salvation of souls is the very thing that has been obscured and almost completely lost over the past 50 years. And that's what I want to address tonight. Yeah, it's so important because the argument of the month, which I'm sure most of our viewers by now know, our good friend Ken, Kent Worktorl right now is in the kitchen working on, the, on tonight's meal, but he's made this, this point so many times that what we're concerned about is a loss of Catholic identity. And that's why this debate tonight, I think, fits in exactly with the agenda that the argument of the month is trying to do. What do we still have to believe as Catholics in order to be saved? What is the church teaching? What is infallible? What does it mean to be a Catholic? And I think you're going, you're going to probably touch on this tonight. If it's not important for any of us to go out and evangelize, really important, not, not, not the new sort of idea of evangelism, Evangelization. But if it really is an imperative that we try to convert our friends and neighbors and family to the church, eventually we're going to come around to the point where it's not all that important for us to be Catholic. And there you have the, 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 uh, the loss of identity that's been so obvious, uh, over the, especially over the past 25 years, but over the past half century. Um, so, so that's why I think it's so important that you're coming in to debate this. It's not just a, a, an academic debate. It has to do with the, really the the mainstream Catholic losing the idea of what it means to be Catholic. Well, one of the paradoxes involved here is that we have what is called the talking church. There's a lot of talk today about evangelization. You can get uh, quotations from John Paul II and from the current Pope about how we have a duty to evangelize and spread the gospel to the whole world. But the problem is the meaning of evangelization has changed. In none of these pronouncements over the past 50 years, is it said that we evangelize because without it, people will be lost for all eternity? Evangelization now has been basically a kind of advertising campaign, spread the good news, share the joy. Uh, wouldn't you really rather be a Catholic? Uh, the Catholic Church has become a kind of Cadillac, and people can get into the Cadillac and have a, you know, push your ride toward heaven. But then again, the other religions are perfectly serviceable Chevrolets and Toyotas, and they'll get you to your destination one way or the other. That's the prevailing mentality today. And although we hear analysts talk about the new evangelization, new evangelization really in practice amounts to no evangelization. That's right. Chris, say something, if you would, about the history of this, of this error. I mean, obviously, to say that it's complete universal salvationism is probably an exaggeration, although certainly with many, many, it's de facto universal uh, event, or, uh, salvationism that we're talking about. Where did it come from? I think sometimes people point to Pius IX as having begun to open the door a little bit with respect to the exceptions to the dogma. But I think one thing really important for us to, to realize and to share with the men here at the Argument of the Month, it didn't start at Vatican II, and it certainly isn't the creation of Pope Francis. Well, it started as, as early, as far as I can reckon, 1864, when Pius IX came out with an encyclical, Quanta, Quanta Conficiamor, in which he basically says, I'm putting it very bluntly, enough speculation, please, about the fate of those who are not in the church. God in his mercy may save a certain number of those who are not in the church in ways that can be known only to him. But we don't know that with any certainty. And so he said, all further discussion of this is forbidden. 
what we have to hold fast to is that the church is the sole ark of salvation, and then outside of her, all will be lost. They will perish in the flood, he said. And he wrote that encyclical to basically squelch this tendency among people to speculate endlessly about the fate of non-Catholics to the point where essentially people are beginning to believe that non-Catholics de facto are Catholics already in some obscure manner and basically everybody is safe. Mm -hmm. So that the exception swallows the rule and the rule no longer becomes important. And so it, it, effectively what happens is that not being a Catholic through this transmogrification of the whole idea of, of evangelization, not being Catholic becomes the ordinary means mm -hmm. of salvation. Mm -hmm. Ignorance takes the place of the state of grace. Oh, leave that person alone. He's ignorant of the truths of the faith. And if you educate him, then he, he has to assume the obligations of the faith. No, he's in good conscience. Leave him alone. Cardinal Ratzinger, in a very important address in 1991, said that this way of thinking has crippled the disposition to evangelize in the post-conciliar church. Why evangelize? Leave the person alone. His ignorance will save him. But his ignorance doesn't save him. Mm -hmm. Pope after pope has said this before the council. The Council of Florence made it clear. The magisterium unanimously declared that those who are lost in ignorance and error will perish without the helps of the church. Speculation about the invincibly ignorant is just that, mm -hmm. speculation. And that is why the imperative to evangelize is more important now than ever, because people are lost more deeply in error than they ever have been in the history of the church, perhaps. Say something about this phenomenon that we've all noticed, the difficulty that good priests are finding to keep young people coming to Mass on Sunday. By the time they hit eighth grade, many of them are gone. By the yeah. time they get their car and they're on their own, they're gone. And, and it seems to me that it has something to do with a breakdown in logic. And young people are always, I think, the quickest to sort of smell out a problem like this isn't logical anymore. If there are seven sacraments, and we as Catholics, we like recourse to those sacraments because we need to have those sacraments, those channels of grace, in order to be saved, we still have no certainty that we're going to be saved. And, but, but then you turn to, your, to your, your Protestant friends, or even worse, you turn to your Hindu or your, your Muslim friends, and you say, they don't need any of those seven sacraments. I think young people are getting that message loud and clear. Well, how important are these seven channels of grace that are established by our Lord? They can't be all that important. Well, in, 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 in quanto conficiamo, Pius and I made precisely that point. He said, look, it's all well and good to talk about the, the, the attractiveness of the faith, the beauty of the faith. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. People have to understand the bare truth that our Lord himself proclaimed when he launched the church. He who believes not shall be condemned. That's the truth. Yeah. Even the New Catechism in section 161 says that without faith, specifically faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to please God and one cannot attain salvation without that faith. That is what we know. That is what is defined dogma. All speculation about the fate of those who do not openly profess the faith of Christ, again, it's just that, speculation. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you create the impression among young people that all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy, that I'm okay and you're okay, well, they say to themselves, I'm in, I'm in any danger of hell, and if I'm not in any danger of hell, why do I have to go to Mass? Why do I have to go to confession? Right, right. The erosion has been disastrous over the past 50 years. Church attendance has plummeted, and the Catholic schools are closing, parishes are closing, the pews are emptying. As John Paul II admitted in his book-length interview, people of our time are no longer sensitive to the four last things. Mm -hmm. They no longer think about death, judgment, heaven, and hell. But to, to save people from a death in, in a state of mortal sin and an eternal perdition in hell is the very reason the church was founded. It's the very reason Christ died on the cross, to atone for our sins and make it possible for us to avoid the eternal damnation which would otherwise be our lot if not for the grace he won through the sacrifice on Calvary. These simple truths have been completely forgotten over the past 50 years. Churchmen aren't preaching them anymore. Bishops aren't preaching them. And we're certainly not hearing that this from the Vatican. Yeah. We're hearing, I'm okay, you're okay. That's right. A smiley face religion. You know, and what's going to happen, I fear tonight, I hope it doesn't happen when Mark Shea comes in and you begin the debate, is this whole idea that traditionalism and traditionalists are so mean and they're so nasty because why? Because we, we, we appear to a group of, of, of men watching to be smart allies because we have all the answers. Well, it's not us. It's not our opinion. This is what the church taught for 2,000 years. And the reality is there really isn't an answer to that other than to say, well, the church was wrong for 2,000 well, years. Well, this is the mode of argument in our modern age, which Alistair McIntyre has called the age of emotivism. 
people argue with emotions. Oh, you're so mean. Yeah. Our Lord was not being mean when he said, he who believes not shall be condemned. Mm -hmm. He was not being mean when he said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. He was not being mean when he said that he would separate the sheep from the goats and the goats would go to hell. He was not being mean when he said, those who have done good will arise unto the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil will arise unto the resurrection of death. He wasn't being mean, he was telling us the truth about our situation. But now it's uh, what I call the push-button argument. You find, a, you find a button and you push it. Oh, that's mean. That's intolerant. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's the truth. Well, i got to say, I mean, uh, Mark Shea is, is coming in, and I think that's to his credit. Um, we'll see it how is it goes. I, I really think it is. Um, he's try he, he, This is something I think oftentimes traditions don't realize, is that you have this thing. You have, a, you have a, the ability now to appeal to authority, 50 years of authority, a, 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 an ecumenical council of the church, a couple of canonized popes, a beatified pope, the whole uh, sort of development or uh, evolution of dogma, if you will, since the council. And so there is there is an ability to appeal to that. There's also an ability or a susceptibility for people to be deceived by it and to say, well, this is what the church is teaching. Who am I? I'm just a layman. I, I, I got to go with what the popes are saying. And that's just the nature of the revolution. It's just that serious. So you can have a person like Mark who isn't necessarily ill-willed or trying to be a heretic or trying to be a cis or anything else. He's trying to follow this thing. He's trying to square the circle, and it's very difficult. So I don't know what you think, but I'm kind of glad that Mark uh, agreed to come in here so we can kind of put these things on display, these, these, these polemics, these very serious arguments between traditional Catholics and neo-Catholics. Uh, and, and see and see who's left standing in the end. Not, well, not, not which man, but whose argument. Which the old church or the new church? My, my experience with, with debating people of, of this constituency in the church are that they don't want to debate. Mm -hmm. They don't want to debate because I think they sense that they can't win. They can't win, not because so-called traditionalists are such great debaters, because what they're really doing is arguing with the church herself. Mm -hmm. They're arguing with the teaching of every pope and every council for 1,962 years. And the problem for them is that that teaching has never been officially overturned. As I said a few moments ago, section 161 of the Catechism still says on paper mm -hmm. that one cannot be saved without belief and faith in Jesus Christ and the one who sent him. That's still the teaching of the church. And yet, they have to admit that all around them, churchmen are sending signals from the Pope on down exactly to the contrary. Mm -hmm. This video with the Muslim and the Buddhist and the, and the rabbi and the apparently clueless priest that was just broadcast from the Vatican mm -hmm. sends the clear message that all religions are more or less good. Let's all just get along. We're all finding our way to God on different pathways. And at the end, you have the little montage of the baby Jesus and the menorah and the Muslim prayer beads and the statue of Buddha all being held out together in the, in the final frame of that video. The only message you take away from that is it isn't necessary to be a member of the Catholic Church to be saved. And yet that is a defined dogma of the faith. So when people come in here and try to defend the status quo, this, uh, this what I call this smiley face religion, which has replaced the real thing, they have a very difficult time. They really can't win the argument. Because again, they're arguing with our Lord himself, with the divine commission, with his warning that without faith in him it is impossible to be saved. That's a pretty tough argument to win. Yeah, 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 it sure is. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's what we're going to see tonight, how, how this holds up. What are we going to do here? What's the, uh, as Catholics, which are we going to believe? And you think about something like what we just saw this video that you're talking about. Basically, that's a, that's a video from the Vatican, from the Pope even, arguing that all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy, which you'll immediately recognize as being lifted right from Mortalia Monimos by Pius XI, in which he said that's a condemned proposition. And so, it really, you have to say, as, you, as the neo-Catholic apologists, you have to say, this is why what's going on now is in conflict with the past. This is why the past was wrong. But you can't argue that it's not in conflict, because clearly it's in conflict well, you, with the You have past. to say that the church has somehow progressed or arrived at a new understanding of dogma, which is the essence of modernism, by the way, condemned by Pope St. Pius X, one of the greatest popes in church history. The essence of modernism is that dogma changes. The words might be the same, but we understand them differently. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to evangelization, oh yes, we still evangelize. We just don't try to convert anybody mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. We talk to Catholics about being better Catholics. Rediscover your faith. So evangelism is inwardly directed. It's no longer an outreach to the people of the world who, as every pope before Vatican II said, live in darkness and error. Mm -hmm. In the Good Friday prayer intentions, what do we pray for? We pray that the idolaters that the pagans of all sorts, that those involved in Islam and, and the Jews, who as St. Paul said have a veil over their eyes, mm -hmm. will be rescued from their condition and brought into the Catholic Church. That's how Catholics prayed mm -hmm. for 19 centuries. Suddenly, that's, uh, 
Eh, reject it. Mm -hmm. It's considered offensive. Contrary to dialogue, interreligious dialogue, and ecumenism, all three of these things are novelties. And the irony is, we're told that as traditionalists, we're hardbound Pharisees who advocate the traditions of men. No, we advocate ecclesiastical traditions and, other, and apostolic traditions that go back almost 2,000 years. The traditions of men were those invented in the past 50 years. Dialogue, mm -hmm. ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, these are inventions. The church never heard of these things before 1962. And for the sake of these human traditions, what I'm going to argue during this debate is, is we see the church effectively abandoning what the Divine Commission is all about, reaching out to those in darkness and error and making them members of the Catholic Church through preaching the gospel to save their souls. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. It's, and that's what's not being done. It's not being done, and, and there's such you know, really interesting irony here in that traditionalists are you know, neo-Pelagian, fundamentalists, and so forth, for you know, uh, putting so much stock in the teaching authority of the church, the constant magisterial teaching of the church, and yet now we have all this novelty, and we're also accused of being bad, 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 because we're not taking this novelty as being presented by a pope. Not even infallibly promulgated, just, just his opinions on these things. So, th so they kind of want to get us both ways. We rely on the past. We, we could count on that's That's our, 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 our security and our safety in knowing that we're on the right path. And at the same time, we're bad for not taking the novelty from the lips of a pope who thinks we should. Yeah, by the way, and the, and the novelties I'm talking about have never been proposed as doctrines. There's no council saying whoever does not engage in dialogue, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. Whoever is not an ecumenist, let him be anathema. These are pastoral novelties in the pastoral realm. They're either wise or unwise. It's not a question of true or false. You can't say that dialogue is true or false. Mm -hmm. It's something you do. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't produce results, you move on to something else. It's a, it's a pastoral strategy over the past 50 years that obviously goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, it does go somewhere. It affirms the other party in his error, legitimates him in his error, and makes the errors worse. After 50 years of dialogue, every single Protestant sect has deteriorated to the point where you can't even, Martin Luther would condemn them as heretical. Mm -hmm. They're ordaining women as priests and bishops, practicing homosexuals are accepted as legitimate members of, of these Christian bodies. They're even being ordained themselves as priests and bishops. Obviously, they accept divorce, contraception, abortion. They are cesspools at, at this point of immorality. That's right. They are doing things that Protestants of 50 years ago would look upon with horror. And yet the dialogue continues. It continues. And then they say, well, the reason we're dialoguing like this is to meet them where they are. We're not meeting them where they yeah, are. We're leave leaving them, them there. where they are. Meet them where they are and leave them there. Tell me, tell me a little bit, running out of time here before this is going to kick off, but your motivation obviously is not to beat Mark, Mark Shea per se. Your motivation obviously, the reason that we, we're hosting this debate is for souls, is to bring these arguments to give guys a better understanding of their fate. What, what, what made you agree to come in? Is that, what, what, what was your motivation? I, 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 want, I want to try to talk about some simple truths that have been forgotten and to wake people up to the reality of our situation. Too many people have tried to explain it away for too long and the results have been a disaster for the church. Evangelization is no longer evangelization. It needs to be evangelization once more. We have to overcome the situation that John Paul II admitted to, that catechists and evangelizers have lost the courage to preach the threat of hell. That's what I'm here to talk That's about That's exactly tonight. right. Good. Well, I don't want to uh, steal any more of your thunder. You probably want to sequester yourself somewhere and prepare for the big tilt. You but, have to uh, do some Buddhist meditations. Right, right. But thanks so much for coming in. I'm really looking forward to the debate. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so, Mike. Good. Thanks very much, folks. I'm Michael Mai for Remnant TV. We'll let you know how this debate goes. Right now, we're filling up. We'll probably have about 500 guys in here tonight to see how this debate unfolds and to see who's left standing in the end. Can't wait to see. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.